basis of the Antillian experience. This shipwreck of fragments, these echoes, these shards of a huge tribal vocabulary, these partially remembered customs, and they are not decayed, but strong. And here they are, all in a single Caribbean city, Port of Spain, a downtown babble of shop signs and streets, mongrelized, polyglot, a ferment without a history, like heaven, because that is what such a city is in the new world, a writer's heaven. That's how Derek Walker described this city and what it meant to him in his Nobel Lecture in 1992 when he became the first writer from the English-speaking Caribbean to win the prestigious literary prize. The architecture of his poetry hung on its framework. Its color and vibrancy helped make his words come alive. He knew, as we all do, that a culture is made by its cities. Port of Spain has similarly inspired myriads of other writers whose work can be found here at the very well-stocked National Library, one of the most iconic buildings in the city. In fact, this beautifully restored old fire station building on the northeastern corner of the library was once home to Derek Walcott and the Trinidad Theatre Workshop. We retraced the journeys of several writers who feature Port of Spain in their work, step into the enthralling worlds they've created, create a literary mashup, mixing stories with a sense of place to make literature come alive. We'll start at the Red House, the seat of Trinidad and Tobago's parliament and the resting place for the remains of at least 60 indigenous ancestors, whose bones were discovered on the site when restoration of the building began back in 2013. In Ismet Khan's novel, The Jumbi Bird, which melds Indo and Afro mythology to explore a new sense of Caribbeanness. He describes the Red House as the largest, the tallest, one of the most beautiful buildings in Port of Spain. Painted a dull brick red, weathered with time and rain and sun, the Indians were particularly fond of the Red House. It reminded them of a Hussein the papier-mâché replicas of their hero's tombs which they pulled through the streets at festive times of the year, amid great ceremony, drum-beating and promenading. Some say that the design was stolen from Hindustan, but there were others who knew differently. The Red House meant that they were all illegitimate children, that there were no legal records of their birds housed in that building. The Red House and its bright red ink stained them at their roots. The determination by this pioneering generation of Caribbean writers to tell stories from a perspective other than the colonial gaze began to bring a shift in the way we saw ourselves, imbuing in us a sense of resilience and a belief that we could forge our own identity. Across the street from the Red House is the place that Trinbegonians colloquially refer to as the University of Woodford Square or the People's Parliament. a hub for political rallies in the lead-up to Trinidad and Tobago's independence from Britain, and a place where pan-African activists would give talks on history, philosophy, and politics during the Black Power era. A perfect example of how we took a space where indigenous people were slaughtered and enslaved people publicly hanged and turned it into a launching pad to craft our future. This square features prominently in Walcott's Midsummer Collection. Midsummer stretches beside me with its gatsion. Trees with dust on their lips, cars melting down in its furnace. Heat staggers the drifting mongrels. The capital has been repainted rose. The rails round Woodford Square, the color of rusting blood. 
Walcott was St. Lucian born, but he developed much of his work through the Trinidad Theatre Workshop, which he founded in the 1950s, and which is where I first met and worked with him much later, of course, after he won the Nobel Prize. And Port of Spain was always a huge inspiration. There's a line in one of his poems called The Spoiler's Return, where he says, all Port of Spain is a 12.30 show. It was a satirical look at the city through the voice of the late Calypsonian, the mighty spoiler. He says, it's carnival, straight carnival, that's all. The beat is bass and the melody, bob all. <laughs> Walcott understood that the comical aspects of Caribbean people were often a way of processing the heavy burden of colonialism, a recurring theme in his work. We cannot erase our history. It is a permanent part of who we are, as solid as this lighthouse. But as we overcome its painful legacy, it also holds the possibility of lighting our way, guiding us safely through to a new definition of ourselves. This Spanish port, piratical in diverseness with its one-eyed lighthouse, this damned sea of noise, this ochre harbor, mantled by its own scum, offers from wrought iron balconies the 19th century view. You can watch it become more African hourly, crusted roofs, hot as skillets, peppered with cries. So when the stores draw their blinds like an empire's ending, a cloaked wind bent like a scavenger rakes the trash in the gutters. It is hard not to see the past's vision of lampposts branching over streets of bush, the plazas cracked by the jungle's furious seed. It is as if the Caribbean wants to leap proudly and fiercely into its fullness. You see glimpses of it everywhere you look. This desire to defy the odds, to rebuild selfhood and belonging from splinters of separation and suffering. It reaches its pinnacle on the hill, the East Port of Spain community that is the setting for Earl Lovelace's much loved Caribbean classic, The Dragon Can Dance. This is the hill, Calvary Hill, where the sun set on starvation and rise on potholed roads Thrones for stray dogs that you could play banjo on their rib bones, holding garbage piled high like a cathedral spire. This is the hill, swelling and curling like a macabre snake from Observatory Street to the mango fields in the back of Mova. Its guts stretched to bursting with a thousand narrow streets and alleys and lanes and traces and holes, holding the people who come on the edge of this city to make it home. In the novel, Carnival is the heart of our identity, as the main character, Aldrich, channels his emotions into dancing his dragon mass. Oh, he danced. He danced pretty. He danced to say, you are pretty. Calvary Hill, and John John, and Lavanti, and Shanty Town. Look at the colors of your costumes in the sunshine. Look at your colors. You is people, people. People is you, people. He wanted everybody to see him. When they saw him, they had to be blind not to see. They had to be deaf not to hear that people everywhere want to be people and that they're going to be that anyway, even if they have to rip open the guts of the city. guts of Port of Spain to the heart of Belmont. Right at the foothills of the Laventy Hills, Belmont is actually one of the first suburbs of Port of Spain and it's a place where over time a black professional creative class emerged. And speaking of class and creativity, here's my friend the writer Barbara Jenkins. Oh lovely to see you and how, how are, you are doing? things? Very, very well, good. very very well. So you're home? Home by you? My home? Your home? Home for all of week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belmont. I know this is a source of inspiration for you. And the place, the writer's place, just up the road there. 
Um, tell me, how does Belmont figure, or does it figure in the story at all? Actually, I was quite surprised on rereading it recently that I hadn't described any place other than the pub itself, and the, the bar. bar. Itself. Yes, just the bar and uh, the people. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I felt that the bar encapsulated a world, right. a world representing Belmont. Right. It's called We Place, but right. the book is called The Writer's Place, yes. So I'd love to hear a little piece straight from the book, and then we could talk a little bit more about, you know, the story behind it. and. Okay, so I'll read a little bit about um, the main character, mm -hmm. Indira, right. coming back to the place where she has been kind of abandoned by her husband right. and deciding she would claim it for herself. It is high noon when Indira reach home. The writer's place standing tall, solid. She look up the full length of its height. How easy to see everything in clean black and white terms in stark daylight. No blurred edges, no gray areas. She straightens her back and stride across the forecourt to place both her hands against the worn, wide, barred double doors. She leans against the door for a while, allowing its strength to take her weight. How solid, how reliable it feels. The writer's place, she say, I talk into you. Yes, you. You belong here, and I belong here too. Is the writer's place both of us. Wow. The name is so incredible and I know it's not just about the bar but for me I, by extension Belmont is the writer's place in many regards. Absolutely. One of the things that's always struck me about Belmont is the diversity of the place, the multiplicity of communities. The diversity is in every direction. Um, we had the big houses around Belmont mm -hmm. Circular Road and then more humble accommodation a little further down. So you had a diversity in style and size of house, the little Warren lanes and so on are down in this area. But there was also a huge diversity of people. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a Belmont face, but it is not a face with a particular racial mix or ethnicity. It's just a face of belonging to yeah. a place. They're all mixed up. Yeah. yeah. This is a place with, with character and characters. Yeah. A short distance away to the north of the Queen's Park Savannah is the Botanic Gardens. I'm here to meet with Brianne McIver, new author of a book called Where There Are Monsters, to discuss her short story, Robber Talk, for which the Botanic Gardens is one of the locations. So, Brienne, Where There Are Monsters, the wonderful title. And I know we're here to talk about Robber Talk, which is an even more intriguing title for me because I'm a mass man. So the idea of Robber Talk is right up my alley. But tell me about how you use the idea of Robber Talk in this story. Well, the story actually begins on a stage in Napa and this midnight mm. robber, he delivers this fantastic robber speech, brings the audience to their feet and right. round of applause. And afterwards, we see the characters, he goes backstage and he appears to be very different from his Midnight Robber persona. Right. Very meek and mild. Um, there's a girl who plays a pair of Gennard that he's interested in. Um, but as the story progresses, we actually realize that there's a darker facet to his personality and that a lot of what he says on the stage as his robber talk is actually things that he does to women and that he really is this very kind of dangerous character. I um, remember playing Ulmas as a child. I was a baby doll and okay. I loved, you know, dressing up, getting into character. And so to set a story in Port of Spain and to write about Carnival was just the most natural thing in the it's world. It's natural. Yeah. It's in you. Absolutely. So we're here in the Botanic Gardens and I know that, that this location is specific to the story. The gardens, actually, it serves the purpose of the character because on one hand, well, he's a country boy, so he would love, you know, this ode to nature. Um, nice to walk with a friend, romantic possibilities. But on the other hand, it's night, it's secluded, it's quiet. It's a perfect cover for monstrous activities. So I think like a lot of nature, the gardens is both beautiful, but also has this dangerous yeah. element. 
So, great. Would you mind sharing a little bit of the story with us? Sure, absolutely. So, this is when they've just come into Plan, the garden. Fence. Yep, and I'm going to do um, speak for both parties. Right. So, you come here a lot? All the time. I go to the botanic gardens too. I sit under my favorite trees and read. You have favorite trees? Of course, they're just like people. The Saman's a cool guy, but the Immortal's a bitch. Anna laughs. Did you learn about those trees in Matura? Mostly. My mother let me climb them. All except the silk cotton, of course. Why not? You town girls. You don't know when to be afraid. Silk cotton trees shelter spirits. That's why you can never cut them down. Anna giggles again. You don't believe that. I wouldn't risk it. I point to the gardens, gloomy and grey under the sliver of moon. There's one in there, I see. In the gardens? There isn't. Sure. You just have to know where to look. Are we taking a, a look at the fact that the city of Port of Spain has inspired and spawned so many storytellers and so many incredible stories. And you're one of the more recent voices to, to be added to that list. So what is it about Port of Spain that inspires you? Or... I think that Port of Spain, there's so much history, there's so much wonder, and it's so different. You know, you can be somewhere like mm -hmm. here, like the gardens, and just a short while away, you know, you can walk down a street, be in Belmont, completely mm -hmm. different setting. And I think that, you know, when the protagonist is looking for the silk cotton tree, he says, you know, you just have to know where to look. And I think that it's the same for the city of Port of Spain. There's so, so much for stories. writers. You just, yeah. have to know where to look. you just have to know where to look. Where are we looking next? 26 Nepal Street, St. James, which was the home of V.S. Naipaul between 1947 and 1950, the year he left for Oxford University. This family residence inspired A House for Mr. Biswas, his great novel of 1961. Not everyone may realize that the book's title character was based on Sipasad Naipaul, Savidya's father. Amidst this mini city that never sleeps, with its bars and boutiques and markets and masjids, this architecturally ordinary house still fits the description given in the novel. The house could be seen from two or three streets away and was known all over St. James. It was like a huge and squat sentry box, tall, square, two-storied, with a pyramidal roof of corrugated iron. The house has been restored and is run by the NGO Friends of Mr. Biswas. Professor Kenneth Ramchand, who chairs the group, has promised to give us a peek. So, Professor, here we are, the famous house for Mr. Biswas. I feel as if I'm sitting in history at this moment. I've read the novel and Naipaul is one of my favorite writers. Tell us a little bit about your efforts to ensure that we have access to a space like this. Um, you are indeed sitting in history. Huh? The chair on which you're sitting is part of the set that accompanied the dining table that we're sitting at. This table and those chairs were in the house in 1946 when Sifasad Naipaul bought it. And I'm sitting in a spot that Vidya Naipaul claimed as his corner. <laughs> this is where he did his homework. This is where he ate. Nobody could go there. Yeah, about the efforts to get it, it's, it's a nice story because the house was put on the open market and I heard about it. And um, I quickly formed a group called Friends of Mr. Biswas. Right. And it was very lucky that I was in the Senate at the time 
Within two weeks, they were in negotiations to get the house. Right. And so it was acquired in 1996. And Friends of Mr. Biswas, which was an informal group, then had to be established by Act of Parliament. Right. And after that, they put us in charge of their house to turn it into a Naipaul Museum. Right. And a, a goal that we inserted to turn it into a house of literature that would encourage writers from every ethnic group in Trinidad and Tobago to achieve in the way the house helped the early Naipauls and Capildeus to achieve. So what can the house teach us about the book? And what could the book teach us about this house that we're in? You could just look at the title. Mm -hmm. A house, a house of for Mr. Biswas. Yeah. We put the emphasis on the Mr. Because this is a book about the life of a man from 1906 to 1953. And his struggles against a feeling of emptiness and non-entity his acquiring of the house was a marker of his victory over circumstance. As you read this novel, by the time you come to the end, the house is a physical representation of an indestructible and indomitable man. The hero dies in 1953, right. and so did Sipasa Naipaul. This book is very much about the life of Sipasad Naipur, the journalist, the would-be writer, the writer of a collection of short stories came out in 1943 mm -hmm. called Guru Deva and Other Indian Tales. This was a great novelist, Monkey. If he had had opportunity, I, I would say this on record, if he had had opportunity, he would have been a greater writer than Vidya mm -hmm. Naipur. A House of Mr. Biswas has been consistently ranked as one of the, you know, top novels in the English language in the 20th century. Why do you think that is? A lot of people don't realize that Naipaul has very carefully constructed this novel. The first part is the country. Yeah. The second part is Port of Spain. Yeah. As soon as Mr. Biswas hops on the bus and gets to Port of Spain and feels the excitement of the city and so on, the novel announces that we're looking at drastic changes in the life of these people. Mm -hmm. So this book, for a Trinidadian person, this book is partly about the emergence of the Trinidadian person. I, I don't want to sound parochial, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it matters to me very much that this is a book of our civilization. In every society in the world, there are monolithic forces trying to deny you your selfhood, denying you your identity, denying you a place in the world, making you feel you are nobody and nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, I think it matters very much that it appeals to people all over the world. But I don't think that's why a writer writing out of his culture. That's not why he writes. The range of books we've delved into proves that Port of Spain is not a singular story. Many of Naipaul's subsequent books, Miguel Street, The Mimic Men, are testimony to this. As a cast of characters, as colorful as a city itself, parades across the pages. Writers understand the layers and nuances of the capital, its culture and contradictions. And the best vantage point from which to appreciate them is high above the city. Guyanese Trinidadian author Unya Kempudu writes about Port of Spain from the perspective of another hill, Lady Chancellor.
Port of Spain spreads below Atta, sitting on a little stone wall at the edge of the lawn. The hills wrap her back, curving into the distance on either side. They cradle the suburbs and town gently down to the waterfront. The promising sky clear against it, clean and innocent. Baby blue, tinged with the white of heat to come. Vaulting higher, trailing scanty clouds way over the hills. The fluffy fronds of the grugubef palms and bamboo foothills close by give the scene a Casabon touch, she thinks. An illusion of colonial pastoral bliss. The beguiling tropics. Is maturity compromised beauty? It's a question that anyone who writes about Port of Spain asks at some point or the other. To achieve our own identity, what must we sacrifice? New generations of Caribbean writers will undoubtedly continue to explore the answers. Thank you.